On the other side of a storm is the strength that comes from navigating through it. Raise your sail and begin. Just because you're struggling doesn't mean that you're failing. I think sometimes people equate struggling with failure. It, it's, it's not, it isn't even close. In fact, if you're struggling, it tells me that you're still in the game. We don't see these incredible opportunities first because every opportunity that you and I have is surrounded by a problem. I've never gone to an opportunity that I didn't have to go to the door of problems first. So the next time you have an obstacle, a, a difficulty, an adversity in your life, don't allow the crisis to numb you. Be alive, learn, feel, fail, learn. That's what it's all about if you want to make this difficult time a good time. I just want you to know that there's a hero within you. I know there is. And during this tough time, let the hero out. Let people see the best of you, your highest aspirations. You be the one who's the lifter and the encourager. Hey, welcome to today's episode of Leadership When It Matters the Most Leader Series. Now, I promised you last week that this week we were going to have something extremely, extraordinarily special for you. Today, in the Leader Series of Leadership When It Matters the Most, John Maxwell is teaching on a tribute to Melvin Maxwell. Now, many of you may know, John and his family said goodbye to Melvin Maxwell last week. And John thought, how fitting would it be that in this series of leading during crisis, during difficulty, how appropriate to take his father, the most impacting leader in John Maxwell's life, and look at his 98 years of leading, leading during difficult times, leading through awesome times. And in this leader series, John Max will do a special episode that is a tribute to his father's leadership. That's today. I'm so excited to introduce to you John, because today John is going to introduce and make even more familiar how powerful and how impacting his dad's leadership really is. As always, our desire is to add value to you so that you will multiply value to others. And today, John Maxwell is going to do just that. I look forward to you getting to see a leader that has made a difference. Here's John with a tribute to Melvin Maxwell. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for one more time joining me with our uh, tribute to my dad. This literally is lesson four because my father lived to be 98 years of age and he just taught me a lot of lessons by his life, by his words. And so we have 29 of them and this is the last session and we're gonna finish up. And I hope you've been with me on all of the lessons. If you haven't, you can go back to Tribute 1, 2, and 3 and, and listen to the other lessons that Dad taught me. Again, his actions, many of the lessons I share with you, I, I really saw him live them out. It was in his behavior even more than in his words. But what a wonderful thing to be able to uh, have a father that was a, a model or somebody that you could see. You see, leadership is visual. It's very visual. And so, you know, Stanford Research says 89% of everything I know in life, I know it because I saw it first. It was visual. And then 10%, I think, of what we learned is audio. So in this teaching on the tribute, again, I want to say, as I have in each one of the lessons, that there'll be a couple of lessons that my father taught me that are about faith. And it's highly possible that you're not a person of faith. And you know I love you unconditionally. I value you. I don't not care for somebody that is different than me. In fact, I think diversity is a kind of a beautiful thing. And some of my great, some of my best friends and my greatest friendships are from with people that are very different than me. And so I, I, when, it, when I talk about faith, just, just enjoy it. There, there probably is something you can learn out of it, but just always understand, uh, I'm not preaching to you. I'm your friend. Okay. And I'm just exposing you to what I've been exposed to. And some of the stuff I was exposed to had the faith element in it, which I'm very grateful because faith is very important to me. 
And uh, uh, during difficult times, uh, hey, during COVID-19 and all the other issues that we've been facing, uh, I often wonder what, what what's a person really do if they're not grounded in faith. And so anyway, uh, I'll, I'll teach maybe a lesson or two on that, but it doesn't matter. You're my friend. You know who I am, and you know how much I already value, period, no strings attached. So uh, I've got eight more lessons to go through. And uh, I'm going to, the first one is prioritize. Uh, Dad taught me to prioritize my life. Uh, he, he basically taught me, you know, first things first. Now, if you've heard me do much teaching, you hear me talk a lot about Pareto principle and uh, the 2080 principle, which basically Pareto said, if you have 10 things to do and you put them in order, number one is truly more important than number two in descending order down to number 10. Pareto says, if you do, just do the top two things, um, you'll get an 80% return of everything you need in life. And that was a life-changing principle, but it was built on the fact that my father also believed that and lived that. I think the difference between dad and Pareto was the fact that if, if you go to the bottom 20% on your list of 10 things, my dad would have said, don't even, don't even touch it. Don't even worry about it. The, the return is too insignificant for you to give it any time. Another thing that my father taught me in priorities that was just absolutely huge was to look at my day, and and, uh, he was the first one that helped me understand that I can't be 100% all day. In other words, we're human. We get tired. we, we, We need to take breaks. We mentally get fatigued. And so he said, John, you, you can't get up in the morning and, and go till night and be always on. You can't be 100%. You got, you got to have a, a, a few times where you say, wow, I, whew, I just need to catch my breath. So he said, you don't have to be 100% on all day, but you do have to be 100% on in the things that are important. Now, this is right back to priorities. So look at your list. You maybe have, I don't know, seven things to do today, seven definite things that you need to accomplish. Now, if you've got seven definite things that you need to accomplish, what you know and I know is they don't all hold equal weight. Pareto, again, would say, what are your top 20% of those seven things? I don't know, what what were maybe two of those things that you really need to make sure. Now, my father would say, John, pick out your, 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 your times that you're going to be 100%. And he said... Nothing is worse than needing to be 100% because the meeting is crucial or the conversation or, or whatever your event is, and you're not being there. So he said, you can't, don't have to be 100% all day, but you do have to be 100% at, at the things which are really, really important in your life. That was life-changing to me, life-changing. Because as I look at every day now, I ask myself, where are my 100% times? Where do I have to be all in? And I pick them. And then I make sure that I can hit the ball at that time. And then maybe I, I don't have to be 100% when I'm having lunch. I, 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 don't, I don't have to be all in then. So, so then you get your breaks. But, but know those. that's all about prioritizing. That's all about energy. That's all about excellence. As you know, if you hear me teach, I talk about the three R's, what, what's required of you, what gives you the greatest return, and what gives you the greatest reward. Kind of want to line those up. When, when what is required of you is also the thing that gives you the greatest return, which is also the thing that gives you the greatest reward, you are in your sweet, sweet spot about priorities. Since I'm talking about Dad, when I grew up, there was a, a little plaque on the wall that... Um, I just saw and read hundreds of times growing up. It, it was just always on the wall. And the plaque was just very simple. It said, only one life, it'll soon be passed. And only what's done for God will last. Now, my father never sat me down and said, let's read this plaque together. Let me explain it to you. He just had it on the wall. And every day as a kid, I visually would look at that had it obviously memorized, knew exactly what it said. But what I didn't realize is that every time I would look at it, every time I would again be reminded that there's only one life, it's going to be passed, and only what you and I do eternally for God, faith, really is going to last. It was, it was one of the great eternal principles that as a kid I grew up with. And here's what I know. 
Those words are more meaningful today than they were when I was a child, and they are more true than they were as a child to me. My father, by example, by plaques, by his words, just taught me how to prioritize my life because he knew and I know, and I want you to know, activity is not necessarily accomplishment. Your goal isn't to be busy. Your goal is to be effective. And that's based on your and my ability to prioritize those things in our life. So that was a lesson that dad taught me, and it was, oh my gosh, it was such a, it was such a good lesson. Uh, another one that dad taught me um, was that uh, not to give up and not to give in. Uh, my father said, I have never known a successful man who quit his way to the top. I love that. And when I think of my father's perseverance, my father, as I've taught in another lesson, was very consistent. My father was very focused. As I just taught a moment ago, my father prioritized well. My dad had no quit in him. He didn't. What he set his mind to do, he stayed right on track. And it was something that I watched in him and it's something that I admired because what happened is, because he had no quit in him, I watched my father handle difficult days and adversity in a very successful way. And what that did for me is when I began to be, as a leader, hit with the tough times, the one thing that never entered my mind was to quit. Uh, maybe I, it entered my mind that I ought to create and, and find a better way. Maybe it entered my mind that I needed to have some people come alongside and help me so that we could maybe together get through a dark time. Maybe it entered my mind that I needed to uh, ask some questions so that I could better be ready to, to stay in the game. But it never entered my mind to quit. Why? Because I never saw my father quit. I saw my father understand that the, at the end of the day, the person that wins is the one that stays in the game. Now, that had such an impression on me as a kid. Now, you have to go back to uh, 1972, 73. Now, I'm, 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 I'm pastor. I'm, 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 I'm doing pretty well, and I'm still living out the lessons that Dad taught me and was teaching me at that time. And I'll never forget, I got into a real tough stretch at my congregation, and to be honest with you, it was wearing me out. And I, for the first time, what was I? I was 28. For the first time, I thought, maybe I ought to quit. Maybe, maybe, maybe I ought to just let this one go. And then I remembered my dad and his example. His, one of his favorite expressions is just keep on, keep it on, son. Keep on, keep it on. Which, uh, there was no quitting, keep on, keeping on, that's for sure. And so I can still remember the day in my office, I picked up the old, thick Webster's Dictionary. Now you can talk about, hey, those were the days. Hey, remember the days when you had encyclopedias? Remember the days we didn't have all this technology and all the wonderful advances we have today? So I took my, I took my old Webster Dictionary, and I went to the Q section, and I got to the word quit. And I took my scissors, and I cut it out of the dictionary. I mean, I literally, in fact, I, I don't have that old dictionary today, obviously, but boy, I wish I did. In fact, I did. I'd bring show and tell and I'd show you because at the age of what would have been the age of about 27, 28, I just cut the word out of the dictionary and I just basically didn't even recognize it as a worthwhile word. Where did I get that? From my dad. He was a 100 percenter. No quit in him. When everybody else was kind of considering it, my dad was head on, game on, staying right with the task. That is a tremendous lesson that I have in my life today because leadership gets very difficult and there are times when you just say, wow, I'm worn out. Now my father did teach me to take a break he did teach me to rest. He did teach me that sometimes you got to back off enough to kind of refuel and renourish yourself. But there was no quit in him. I'm grateful for that lesson that he taught me. 
Another lesson that I learned from my father, my gosh, what a huge lesson this one was. This one has stayed with me throughout my life. I, I just, well, they all have, but my father, he introduced me to, to How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. As you know, my father picked out books for me to read when I was a kid. And if, you read, if you've read How to Win Friends and Influence People, I, I assume you have. I mean, I mean, hello. I mean, can you really go through life and not read that book? Because it is, to me, the relationship Bible. Simple, basic principles on relationships. And Dale Carnegie said the sweetest sound to a person's ear is the sound of their name. And so Dale Carnegie emphasized the importance of remembering names. And, and my father was really good at it. And when I was a junior in high school, we went and took a Dale Carnegie course on Remember Names. I'll never forget it. It was my dad and I took it together. And, and how they had us back then, I don't even know how Dale Carnegie teaches it now, but how they taught it back then was that, that what you did is, is you put a visual object on their head that would relate to their name. So I'm, just for example, if, if, if I met you and and, and, and your, your, name, your name was, let, let's say, John Water, okay? Well, then what I'd do is I, I would put water right on top of your head. I, I, I would put a visual picture of water right there. And so I would visually see water on your head so that when I saw you next, I, I would call you John Water. I, I, remember, I remember one time, speaking of water, I was, um, I was going to my new church in Lancaster, Ohio, and, and had hundreds of people to learn their names pretty quick. And I met uh, the first day. I met a wonderful couple named the Hargis family, and and soon as they said Hargis, I, I I grew up near a lake that was called Hargis Lake, and I thought, oh man, I got this one nailed. And so I put a lake right on top of their head, and the next uh, week when I they came back to church, I I mean I was so confident. I just reached out my hand and said, well, how's how are Mister and Mrs. Lake today? I'll never forget. They looked at me and they looked at each other, and I, of course immediately I realized, oops, I missed that one. I missed that one. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What was your name? They said, Hargis. Of course, then I laughed and I told them the Hargis Lake story. So it's not a foolproof, but here's what I do know. My father impressed upon me that the name is the sweetest sound of the person's ear and that immediately when I get it, if I can visualize something and put it on top of the head so that I can remember their name. When I was pastoring in my last congregation in San Diego, California, a large church, I knew over 3,000 people by name. In fact, I would tell them when they came to church, now you got to go back to now, you've got to go back to 1991, two, three. Those were the Polaroid days with cameras. And I had, I had, oh, I don't know, maybe every week 50 to 60 hosts, hostesses, running around the campus. And they all had a they had a, a way to identify themselves as a host or a hostess, and they had a Polaroid camera. And I would tell I would tell first time people, just just let them take a picture of you. And if you let them take a picture of you, when you come back next week, I'll call you by name. Now this was massive, and that's what they do. They they would take pictures of of our new people, and, and on Monday morning. By 10 o'clock in my office on my desk would be a big key ring with a bunch of Polaroid pictures that are punched out all in that ring with the names of each people at the bottom of the picture. And during the week, I just, ever I had five minute break, I'd pull over that, 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 that ring and with all those pictures and I would look at the picture, I'd look at the name, picture the name, picture the name, and I would memorize those, 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 those names. And and this was this just caught the attention of people. I, I'd said, in fact, I'd say two things. I said, I'll, if you'll let us take your picture, I'll do two things. One is I'll I'll know your name when you come back, and number two is I'll pray for you. And I would look at those pictures and I would pray for those people. I remember one Sunday, I was out in the lobby area, and there was a new couple who'd been there the week before, and I went up and I, and, and and I called them by name, and and the the wife just jumped up and down. She was so excited. I thought, oh my gosh, you know. Why are you so excited? She said, oh, she said, I just want to bet. I just want to bet. So I bet my husband $10 that you'd remember our names because you said you would last week. And he said, no, no, he won't remember us. And she said, I just want to bet. I, 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 you know, thank you for remembering our names. And I said, is that true to him? He said, yeah. He said, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we had a bet. And, and I said, well, I said, then you need to give her 10 bucks. And, and I'm here to witness this. And so 
He got a $10 bill and he handed it to her. And I said, now, you know, my name is John and we teach tithe to the church. I need $1 from, the, from that profit you made. And we both laughed and we both howled. But my dad just taught me, he just taught me to, to remember names. And, and that's another way of telling a person that, that you just greatly, greatly value them, remembering names. Another lesson my dad taught me, oh my, there's so many good lessons. As I look at my list, and honestly, I, as I've started the list, I've, I've thought of a couple more. But as you know, again, I said this, I know at least in tribute to my father, lesson one, maybe in, in the other ones also. These are lessons I wrote down on the last day I was with my dad when he was alive. And he couldn't respond to me at all, so I sat at his bedside with my iPhone, and I literally began to write down lessons I learned from Dad. And when I would learn them, I would just speak to him. I'd say, Dad, here's another lesson you taught me. And I would, I would talk to him about that lesson. And I, we had the most beautiful, intimate father-son time together. So that's where all these lessons, you know, where all these lessons come from. In fact, uh, I, I'm reading off of a list here, but really, when I look at this thing, uh, if, I, I, if I just take you over here for just a second, uh, Dad, six, you know, July 1, 2000. Thanks, Dad, I learned from you. The, these are all my lessons right here. They're just right here on my iPhone. And, of course, I'll keep them there and, and go over them like I'm teaching you that. Now, by the way, I make my dad sound like a saint, but I tell you all the good lessons. But, but he also taught me some bad lessons, too. One of the things he, I learned from my dad was to love ice cream. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> my dad loved ice cream. I love ice cream. We've had many great conversations where he took a court and I took a court and we talked and ate ice cream. So he wasn't a, he wasn't a total saint. He, he also I learned it I learned impatience from my dad. Oh my goodness. Patience was I I didn't teach you anything about patience here in this lesson. My father I'll tell you how impatient my dad was. Just this is fine. I'll just tell you this for a moment. My sister Trish This was when he was probably 92. Took it, took him in his car to a, a place to, you know, uh, 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 like a Jiffy Lube place to, you know, to get his car taken care of. And, and so they were sitting down, and after about thirty minutes, he looked at Trish. He said, "Aren't they done yet?" And, and she said, "Well, they'll be done pretty soon." And about forty minutes, and he said, "Trish, they ought to be done by now." And she said, "Well, let me go check." She went and checked, and she came back. And said, "They said it's going to be a few more minutes." And, now, Dad, he's up. He's pacing the floor. He's looking at his watch. He said, yeah, as if he had some place to go. And, and finally, about 50 minutes in, he looked at her and said, okay, I got an idea. She said, what, 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 Dad? She said, he said, let's go buy a car. Let's go buy a car. She said, what do you mean? He said, I can buy a car quicker than I can have this car have a loop job. He said, let's just let. And she said, Dad, you can't go buy a car. We got to wait on this car. Now, my father, so imp- he's ready to go buy a car. Let's just go buy a car. If I have to wait this long, I might as well go buy me a new car. Then I won't need the lube job on it. So he wasn't a saint. I learned to also speed with my dad. I mean, he, uh, so, the, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but he was kind of, his impatience, I've, I, he taught me to even cut in line a few times. So he wasn't a saint, but the lessons I'm giving you were life-changing lessons to me. So let me just give you, I don't know, I've just got a couple more, th- and, and, and then I'll finish this thing up. M- my father, oh my, this was, this was, this was huge. My dad taught me to do my best always. And if you're writing it down, just take the word always and put it in capital letters. My, my father felt that if it was worth doing, it was worth doing right. And he, he would often say, John, if you don't do your best, two things happen. One, you have to go back and do it. Or two, you didn't go back and do it. And you shortchanged yourself and you shortchanged the people that you were trying to help. He said, don't go that way. He said, why, why would you go do something twice when you can do it best once? And so he was, he just, and, and <clears throat> again, being a person of faith, my father would believe that excellence began uh, because that brought glory to God. If, if you, if you uh, travel, especially in Europe, you look at some of the great old buildings They'll have the expression, you know, year it was built, and then for the glory of God, for the glory of God. And they basically try to live their life and build their buildings as a masterpiece of excellence to honor their creator. 
And my father just believed that with all of his heart. And, and, and so therefore, whenever we did something, we knew that we didn't do it half-heartedly. We didn't tiptoe through the tulips. We had to be all in, dive in, and, and do our very best. And that is something that I'm so appreciative of in my life today. I can still remember when I was a young leader after I you know, went into my first church, and I realized that I was a, I was a naturally a, a, a kind of a, a, a connecting, uh, charismatic kind of communicator, and, and I realized that I was good at it. In fact, I was speaking in a farming community with only 30 people, and to be honest with you, those farmers were just glad to have a little time that they weren't doing chores. And, and so they loved me. And I realized very quickly that I could get up and I could just maybe study for 30 minutes and I could preach a message and they would all be happy. And, and so I asked myself, well, what am I going to do? Am I, am I going to, uh, am I just going to do that and kind of wing it and, 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 and get passing grades? Or am I going to really work for it? And, and I went into a few months of do I wing it or do I work for it? And I'm so glad I, I went back to my father and I realized his teaching stayed with me. I, I, I can't wing it. I've got to do my best. So I literally started writing every sermon out so that I would be clear in my thinking and so that I wouldn't repeat myself. And I started that habit. For 25 years, I wrote out every sermon, word for word. It was an incredible discipline. And it also helped me to realize I've got to give best effort and I've got to get best return for this. My father really developed that that excellence line. And, 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 and he always said to me, son, he said, remember this, you set your own bar of excellence. Don't let someone else set it for you. In fact, he said, if someone else sets the bar of excellence for you and their excellence is higher than yours, then you've set the wrong bar. He said, you should have such a high expectation of what you do that no one else has that high expectation. So you not only want to meet expectations, you want to exceed expectations. That's I, I've done teaching on, on exceeding expectations. You see, only 15% of the people even meet expectations. Only 5% exceed them. And, and my dad understood that if you exceed expectations, if you do your best always, you'll set yourself apart from the rest of the crowd. And that's absolutely life-changing. It's huge. Wow. Dad, I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for you, for all that I learned from you. And then uh, he taught me to, to grow and better myself. He taught me that unknown to me by at the age of, or when I got to the seventh grade, of him putting books in my hands and paying me my allowance to read books. Life changing for me, life changing for my family. Basically, he realized that if he could pick good books and I read them, it would have a positive effect on my life. And, and he was the first one that put me on a, an intentional growth plan. And the only guarantee that you and I are going to have a better tomorrow is the fact that you and I are growing today. If you and I are not growing today, what would make us think that tomorrow has greater possibilities. You don't go into possibilities, you grow into possibilities. You don't go into opportunities, you grow into opportunities. It becomes the natural thing to a person that keeps learning and growing, expanding and stretching. And it was my father that just so beautifully walked into my life and taught me that great lesson of just to grow to better myself. Uh, be enthusiastic. Be enthusiastic. My, my, my father lived enthusiasm. He was a ball of fire. That's why when he died on the 4th of July, I thought that's when he should die. He should die on a day when they're doing fireworks and just celebrating because my dad was a fireworks celebrator guy. My dad wasn't into music very much. He didn't really know music. He, wasn't a, he, he, he was kind of tone deaf and didn't sing very well. But I remember one day when he's a college president and, and he was in chapel and, and, and we sang the doxology and it's just one verse, praise God from whom all blessings flow. You probably know it. And my father just loved the way it just sounded good to my dad. And I'll never forget, he looked at all of us, he said, oh, that was so good. He said, let's sing the, let's sing the second verse. Well, there's no second verse. There's only one verse. 
So my daddy wasn't deterred. He just said, okay, then let's sing the first verse again. And I think that day we sang the first verse five times till it satisfied dad. And he just was contagious with his enthusiasm. When, when I did the memorial message for my dad, I, I talked about his enthusiasm. And so I, I'm going to just read something that I, I shared at his funeral Because my dad, when he was 85, wrote this. It was called Celebrating the Senior Years by Melvin Maxwell. And what does he say? How do you celebrate your senior years? Number one, stay alive and don't quit dreaming. Find new ideas and set new goals. Now, he's 85. Number two, don't give over to defeat and discouragement. Things are not as bad as you think. Number three, never think that you're too old. Moses was 80 and led three and a half million people out of captivity. Number four, never think you've lost your usefulness. Your years have given you both experience and wisdom to share with others. Number five, never think that you're not needed or important. Everyone you meet needs a smile and some loving words. Number six, never stop trying. Persistence always wins. Your candle may be burned down, but not out. Don't complain because you're gray or bald. A lot of people haven't lived that long. Number seven, keep your spirit of praise and constantly think about the goodness of God. Your attitude rather than your aptitude determines your spiritual altitude. Number eight, love God more each day. He is with you. He has no losers, just quitters. You are near the winning line. Just hang on to get there. Number nine, try to leave a memorial that will live on and on. Love, kind words, thoughtfulness, faith, vision, a charitable gift. Well, that was my dad. That's who he is. That's who he was. The last lesson I'll give you, thank you for being with me for these four lessons on tribute. But the last one is, is that my father always taught us to express gratitude to God and express gratitude to others. Always, every day, grateful to God, grateful to others. He lived it. He uh, showed it. And uh, it's just, it's me. It's who I am. In fact, I did this tribute to my father because I'm very grateful for my heritage. It's obvious, I'm sure to you, it is to me, that I won the parent lottery. I didn't choose my parents, I just lucked out. I just happened to get the right ones. And what he taught me lives in me today. In fact, after I taught one of the lessons, Andrew, who's in the studio with me, does such a great job helping me with all this technology. Andrew, as as I was talking about tribute to my father, Andrew, remember you you told me you gave me another title that that you said, I know what you ought to call this series. And and what was it? What was it? Lessons my father lived that live on through me. Lessons my father lived that lived, that live on through me, right? Oh, I like that. Lessons. What is it? One more time. Lessons my father lived. Yeah. So he lived them. Lessons my father lived that live on through me. Well, that's why I teach those lessons. In fact, my dad, he, he, he died, but he'll never die. In fact, at, at his memorial service, his grandchildren stood up and taught lessons that he taught them. They've got many years to live. And then his great-grandchildren shared things that they had learned, principles, life-changing lessons like mine. And those grandchildren are just in their teenagers' years. Think, think how long my dad will live because those principles just live on in others. As I finish my time together, I, I've shared with you um, a few of his principles and lessons that are about faith. That in fact, this one is express gratitude to God and express gratitude to others. And, and perhaps as you've listened to these lessons, and some of them are faith lessons, you've had a desire maybe to you'd, you'd like to know God. Well, if you would, I can help you. My name's John. I'm your friend. If you just go to maxwellfaith.com, you'll see me teach the four pictures of God. Uh, Most people don't know God because they have a wrong picture of him. And in this teaching, it's just a 10-minute teaching. I share with you how you can have a good picture of God because once you see him as he is, you'll want to be his friend. You'll want him to be your friend. 
So I encourage you, um, go to maxwellfaith.com and, 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 and listen to me as I share. And then I'll give you an opportunity to have that relationship with God. And our, our people will reach out to you. And, and, and uh, when you make that decision, they'll give you some free resources, a study guide that's truly going to help you in your faith journey. And, and then there's another surprise in there that you, you, just, you just need to find out about. So anyway. I've loved teaching about my father because you've given me the opportunity to not only pass on great lessons I learned from him to you, you've just given me an opportunity for four weeks to relive my dad. I do it every day, but it seems a little more special when I do it with you. So thanks. God bless. Take these lessons. Apply them to your life. They'll make you better. I promise. Thanks for being with us today on the Leadership When It Matters the Most program. I hope John encouraged you in your leadership just like he encouraged me. Our goal in this time of crisis is to come alongside you, add value to you, so you can multiply value to others. If you go to johnmaxwell.com, you'll find free resources, tools that will help you lead in these very unique times. You'll find our podcast, John Maxwell Leadership Podcast, Minute with Maxwell, a daily word that John will bring to you, as well as our leadership blog. All of those resources on johnmaxwell.com, and they are free and ready for you to encourage you as well as you encourage others. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon when leadership matters the most.